So, a few weeks ago, my boyfriend Igor and I, we were hanging out on the sofa, and he turns to me and says, Liv, what do you think the likelihood is that we'll still be together in three years' time? So, naturally, we both took a pen and paper and wrote down our three-year predictions and threw in our one-year and ten-year ones for good measure, and these are the results. Fortunately, we are pretty much aligned. And because we're both professional poker players, we're very much used to thinking about all kinds of things in terms of probabilities, even potentially emotional topics like this one. But I certainly wasn't always rational around probabilities. For example, the very first time I played poker, it was 2005, and I just graduated university from here in Manchester, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life yet, so naturally I started applying for game shows. And the first show I got on, <laughs> yeah, first show I got on turned out to be a reality show that took five beginners and taught them how to play poker. And, well, I was one of those beginners, and then we would compete for a winner-take-all prize of £100,000, so huge money, especially for a graduate with a ton of debt. So, in one of the first games, we start playing, and I get dealt two aces, which are the best starting hands in poker. And before I knew it, I got gotten all my chips in the middle. And then, my opponent, they get really lucky and hit a miracle card, and I'm out of the game. But it's fine, because I handle it with a calm, stoic dignity. Or so I wish. No, in fact, I end up having a complete meltdown, cry at the tables, and embarrass myself on national TV. <laughs> and why did I do that? Well, I did it because I was shocked. Even though I've been told to expect that aces will lose around 20% of the time, my internal dial just very much didn't feel like a 20%er could actually happen. So, fortunately, I've gotten my act together a bit more since then, and that's largely because what well, poker teaches you to get used to bad luck. If you play the game often enough, you'll expect to see maybe hundreds of thousands of hands over a given year, and so you'll see all these crazy one percenters and freak events happen with the cards over and over. And that's because probabilities compound. While the likelihood of one individually unlucky event happening to us is small in a given year, like getting our phone stolen, or being made redundant, or having one of our five closest relatives die. If you start thinking about all the events that you could consider to be unlucky, then actually the chances build up and up until it's quite likely that one of them happens. And while this might seem kind of depressing, I found that remembering this mathematical fact has helped me manage my expectations better, because then I'm less shocked. And when we're less shocked, then we're better able to reason through a tough situation and not spend so much of our time thinking about negative, unhelpful thoughts like, why me? Why am I so unlucky? Now, I'm not suggesting you'll go out and learn to play poker to get used to bad luck, but it is important to remember to look at life through a probabilistic lens, because as the incredible physicist Richard Feynman once said, nature permits us only to calculate probabilities and yet science has not collapsed. And what he means by this is that the, the world around us, kind of like a card game, is ultimately governed by the laws of chance and statistics. Even, even the fundamental nature of matter, the, the particles whizzing around in our bodies and everything in this room appear to behave in clouds of probabilities, and our universe is just full of all this complexity. And, and yet, through science, the, the process of, of observation and evidence and reason, we can learn to make remarkably accurate predictions by using these probabilities. But we are not all perfect scientists. In fact, far from it. And we make many mistakes in how we think and speak around probabilities. And it's some of these mistakes that I want to talk to you guys about today. So the first of these is our tendency to assume that something is a certainty when it's not. In other words, to assign 100% probability to something. But 100% probabilities are extremely, extremely rare. And this is known as the overconfidence bias, where we tend to be overconfident in the strength of our beliefs and convictions. And this can lead us to a cardinal sin. Gambling without even realizing that we're gambling. And perhaps 
the best example of this is the 2008 financial crisis, which was largely contributed to by the assumption that the house prices across the entirety of the US couldn't all go down at the same time. But they could, and they did, and it was that that kick-started the chain reaction that created the largest economic disaster since the Great Depression. And it's because we knew of this bias that Igor and I decided to ask each other that awful question about whether we think we'll be together, or the likelihood that we'll be together in three years' time, because we're now at that critical stage where we're thinking about things like marriage and move, buying a house together, or maybe moving country. And well, imagine if we went full steam ahead, assuming we're 100% to be together, but maybe our percentage is actually only 60%. So it's crucially important to take a moment to question what it is you'll th you think you're certain about. And especially if it's to do with your relationships, then, well, we have to have these frank, quantified discussions from time to time with our loved ones about things that, well, these potential worst cases. And I like to think of it as taking an insurance policy out on your emotions where you, you pay the, the awkward premium up front, but you're then better safeguarded should the worst case happen. And another mistake we tend to make is we tend to treat near certainties too similarly to one another. So if you look at these two percentages, they look kind of the same, right? But actually, there's a huge difference between the two. For example, if all the nuclear reactors in the world had a safety rating of A instead of B, then instead of us having a 50-50 chance of some kind of nuclear accident every 15 years, we'd expect to have one every 1.5 years. And that would obviously be a huge, huge problem. Fortunately, nuclear power is safer than both of these. But this, this, this thing that we do where we, we tend to sort of treat these fringe, fringe cases a little bit too similarly can lead us to another sin, and that's gambling for stakes we can't afford. Certainly something I've seen a lot of in poker. Um, and an example of this is skiing. When I was a kid and went skiing, we never wore helmets. This was back in the 90s. and They, they just weren't even offered to us. And it wasn't because helmets were super expensive or anything, it's just more because, well, no one really thought through these very remote but potentially worst case disasters of hitting your head in the snow and what, what could actually happen. But nowadays, of course, we know better and it makes you wonder, what, what are other things in life that could be a helmet worth wearing? Maybe it's just making sure we go for those regular cancer screenings or simply putting a bath mat down in our shower. Or just making sure you don't eat that piece of pizza while you're driving. Just wait and have it when you get home. And just as we tend to oversimplify how we think about probabilities, we can let that slip into our language too. For example, you always make us slate. Well, that's because you don't give me enough time to get ready. Well, yeah, that's because you're always on the phone with your friends. Well, that's because you just never actually spend any time listening to me. Well, that's because you always criticize me. Well, that's because you never get anything right. <laughs> these conversations, they, they can escalate somewhat. And that's because we're speaking these absolutes. We're throwing out these alwayses and these nevers, and they're very counterproductive. If you say to someone, you, you never take any time for me, you're literally saying they have never spent any effort on you, and no one likes being accused of something that just clearly isn't true. So then they'll become all defensive and sort of they'll take the easy route out of questioning the, the accuracy of your statement instead of actually taking the time to discuss the change you want. When we do finally try and speak probabilistically in our languages, in our language, we're really bad at that as well. Take, for example, the phrase a fair chance. If I was to say to you, there's a fair chance of rain tonight, what's the first number that pops into your head? Well, I asked this same question on Twitter, and I got around 300 responses, and this was the range of answers. Huge. I got answers from everywhere from 18% all the way up to 90%. And yet, back in 1961, the exact words, a fair chance of success, were the, the words used by the Joint Chiefs of Staff when briefing President Kennedy about the, their estimations of a success of a, an invasion of Cuba. They had met with military experts, and they reckoned that there was like a three to one against chance. So in other words, only a 25% chance of success. But instead of just saying that to Kennedy, the staff told him there's a fair chance, and his interpretation of that was understandably more positive. And while it's not certain from history if that was the exact sort of the deciding factor, we do know that the US soon launched after the, the Bay of Pigs invasion, 
which was a complete catastrophe that took the world one step closer to nuclear war. So if this vague, unquantified language can cause blunders like that at the highest levels of office, imagine the frequency of miscommunications we must all be making in our daily lives. We expect that our products will launch within the next three months. Okay, sure. Or, yeah, love, yeah, I'll, I'll probably be home for dinner. I'm sure we've all been in trouble saying something like that. And that's because we all have very different interpretations of these vague probabilistic words. Words like probably, or frequently, or likely. And again, I ran similar polls on Twitter, and this was the distribution of answers. Even certainly is far from certain. And then, then, we have the really bad words. These are known as weasel words. I guess that there's a chance that maybe, possibly, we could do this. Oh, these words are so bad at actually saying anything, we should just scrub them from the language altogether, if you ask me. But if we do want to use them, then we should only do it when we are deliberately pretending to convey information. But we know that we're not. However, well, most of the time, we are vague with our language out of sheer unconscious habit. But this habit makes us intellectually dishonest with ourselves, and it opens us up to biases, like the hindsight bias or the illusion of transparency, where we think we are being better understood than we actually are. And so now I've taken, I've, I've sort of tried to build the habit in myself to quantify any, any of these fuzzy words when I catch myself using them. For example, if a friend says to me, hey, Liv, what do you think, the, do you think you are going to be able to make the time to help me out with that thing tonight? Instead of just saying, yeah, sure, probably, I'll give them an estimation. I'll say 90%, because even if it feels... <laughs> <laughs> even if it feels like a guess, it's still better than leaving it undefined for them. Because when we say a number, we know that they'll hear that number, but if we use words, we don't actually know what lands in the other person's brain. And a handful of industries have taken to defining their commonly used trouble words. Take the pharmaceutical industry, for example. This is the list of standard definitions of words relating to the frequency of side effects. It's what you might expect to see in your packet of paracetamol at home. And it makes good sense, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to assess the risks to ourselves properly. And I propose we come up with our own set of definitions as well. Perhaps something like this. What if we could all agree to use these as a guideline in our daily lives, or maybe in our workplaces, or even get the media to use them? Because if we want our words to actually mean something, then we need to have a mutual understanding of what they stand for. But ultimately, if there's a situation when we can use a number, then we really should do. And it makes me sad that the society has taught us to think that speaking in numbers is nerdy and uncool, because numbers are awesome. They give us clarity and, and granularity and help us uh, like weigh up our options better in the face of uncertainty. And you all remember that scene in The Matrix where Neo has that, the best bit, where he has that breakthrough where he starts seeing the whole world as it really is and all the little green bits of code trickling down? Well, we too can learn to see the world in probabilities. You can. And then when we do, we'll actually be better equipped to handle all the good and bad luck that life might throw at us. Because while we'll never be certain which path our future will take, we can control the likelihoods of the paths that we want. Thank you.